As someone who's successfully founded multiple businesses, I cannot overstate how important it is to have a single source of truth for your business, for inventory, for revenue, and on and on. There's an amazing tool called NetSuite that can help you do just that. Visit netsuite.com slash SPI to download their KPI checklist for free and support this podcast. If you do find yourself buried in manual work or struggling to have a clear picture of your business, you should know three numbers, 37,000, 25, and one. 37,000, that's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. Number 25, well, NetSuite turns 25 years old this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. And the number one, because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all of your KPIs in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need to grow all in one place. And right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash SPI. That's netsuite.com slash SPI to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash SPI. There's a better way to create a website, a professional, crisp website you'll be proud to publish, and it just takes seconds. This is all thanks to Hostinger's AI website generator. I recently took this for a test drive, even shared this on my YouTube channel. It was mind-blowing. Not just how quick you can build a website, but with the AI, how great it actually can write copy for you. You can use the AI logo maker, plus it got it up in no time, and it looks good. Absolutely mind-blowing. So if you want to build a website, go to Hostinger, because they're a top, highly-rated global web hosting platform. And all you have to do to build a website is just answer three questions and let the AI do all the work for you. You can build as many web pages as you need without knowing how to code a single line of anything. They have great support, too. That was one thing that I had a problem with with a with a with another host back in the day. Hostinger has 24-7 support and a library of video guides. And here's the thing. You can do this for less than $3 a month, including a free domain name. That is crazy. So create a live website now at hostinger.com slash SPI. And listeners of this podcast, you can enter SPI for 10% off your order and a free domain name, H-O-S-T-I-N-G-E-R.com slash SPI and use the code SPI for 10% off and a free domain name. Give it a spin. How many times would you say that you've been distracted today? There was something that you wanted to do or said you were gonna do, but something got in the way, something interrupted you and then you were distracted and you haven't gone back to do that thing or you tried to go back but you weren't in the right mindset and then you had it in your schedule at one time but now it's too late and you have this other thing on your schedule so you have to put that off till tomorrow. Things begin to snowball when we get distracted. And today we're gonna be talking with an expert in the space of distraction. He just wrote a book called Indistractable, How to Control Your Attention and Choose Your Life. And I gotta say, it doesn't matter where you're at in business or in life, You are getting distracted and it needs to stop. And it's gonna surprise you where the effort to stop this should actually be coming from and and where your attention should be. It was actually very surprising to me. And we dive into a lot of, yes, tactics and strategies, but we talk a lot about why we get distracted and how to avoid that. And it's gonna be a beautiful conversation today with the author of Indistractable, Near El, who was on the show uh, not too long ago to talk about his book, Hooked which was a beautiful book and a great conversation and a lot of people loved that interview. You're gonna love this one too. Nir is a great guy, he's very funny and we connect quite a bit here on a lot of similar things related to distractions that we both have. And nobody's perfect, but we can be less distracted and become indistractable today on the Smart Passive Income Podcast. Welcome to the Smart Passive Income Podcast, where it's all about working hard now so you can sit back and reap the benefits later. And now your host, 100% of his success is 100% related to his failures, Pat Flynn. Want to stop grinding through resumes and just meet your match already? Well, you can with Indeed. If you need to hire, you need Indeed. It's your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, plus their matching engine helps you find quality candidates fast. And it works like really fast. In fact, by the time this ad's over, 23 new hires will have been made on Indeed, according to Indeed data worldwide. It's the perfect match of speed and quality. 93% of employers agree Indeed delivers the highest quality matches compared to other job sites. And I think Indeed is the place to go. It's easy to manage. Everything is in just one spot. The interview process, it's scalable with you and your business as it grows. Like there's no other platform you would need than Indeed. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored ad job credit 
to get your jobs more visibility at indeed.com slash smart passive. Just go to indeed.com slash smart passive right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash smart passive. Terms and conditions apply. You need to hire, you need Indeed. We entrepreneurs are at our desks a lot, so having solid equipment is super important. And a sit-stand desk can make a huge difference, as many folks on our team will attest to. If you haven't tried one yet, this offer from Uplift is for you. Plus, you can support the show at the same time. Visit upliftdesk.com slash SPI for 5% off your order. Over a million customers have chosen Uplift Desk. Innovative product designs, reasonable pricing, same-day shipping, free accessories with every desk. You can see why they're such a big hit. And did I mention the industry-leading 15-year warranty? And that covers the complete desk, by the way, not just the top or some fine print like that. Moving while you work is just healthier. And Uplift Desk provides a state-of-the-art experience. They're stable, made of very solid materials. There's over 100 desktop choices and customizations available. Just the choices for material for your desk are amazing, all the way from laminate to eco to bamboo to solid wood. If you want to build the workstation of your dreams, I highly recommend checking them out. Go to upliftdesk.com slash SPI for 5% off your order. That's U-P-L-I-F-T desk.com slash SPI to get 5% off your entire order. What's up, everybody? Pat Flynn here, and welcome to session 387 of the Smart Passive Income Podcast. My name is Pat Flynn, here to help you make more money, save more time, and help more people, too. And each of those three things, you can't really do very well if you keep getting distracted. And like I said in the beginning, how many times, even just today, did you not do the thing that you said you were gonna do or something got in the way and, and, and it was because of that external factor that you are now no longer doing what you should be doing. Maybe it was a ping or a notification on your phone. Maybe you just got a notification right now and it's gonna force you to pause this episode and not listen all the way through, which you shouldn't do. You should listen all the way through. Why? Because this can be a life-changing conversation that we're about to have with the author of the brand new book, Indistractable with Near El. And like I said, a great conversation, so much vibe in this and I cannot wait to share it with you and the biggest takeaway that I had was where the distractions come from and it's the why behind them right because we know that we should turn things off we know we shouldn't answer those things that are notifying us yet we do it anyway why it's because it fulfills certain needs that we have as humans and it's the science behind it that makes it interesting and you're going to hear all about that today with near so let's not wait any longer let's do this Nir, welcome back to the Smart Passive Income Podcast. Thanks so much for coming back on. My pleasure, Pat. It's so good to be back here. You know, it's been since episode 262 where we talked about your book, Hooked, and habit-forming products. And we're here to talk about today your next and upcoming book, which is actually coming out next week, actually, which I'm really excited about because it's something that I and most other people who are in this world have ever need some help with, and that's being distracted. And I think especially for us business owners and, and entrepreneurs, distraction can be the death of any sort of business ideas that we, we might be working on. And Indistractable is what it's called. It comes out on September 10th next week. We'll talk about a little bonus and stuff a little bit later that you're offering everybody who pre-orders, which is really cool. But I want to know, why did you write this book and who is it for? Yeah, so many of us today experience this problem with distraction. I experienced it. Uh, I was a little bit early to the party where, uh, you know, when I wrote Hooked, we're just having the five-year anniversary of Hooked, actually. So when I, I actually did this this revised edition, so I, I was looking back through it. And, you know, I, I remember that after I wrote Hooked, which the idea behind Hook, the reason I wrote the book was, you know, I wasn't trying to help companies like Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and those companies. You know, back then when I wrote Hooked, the problem was not that people would overuse a product. The problem was, and still is, frankly, for most businesses, that nobody uses the product, right? <laughs> I'm guessing the vast majority of people right. listening to me right now have products and services that are not addicting anybody, right? They're just desperate for anyone to use the product because if they would, then the product would actually benefit these folks. And that's really who my audience was for Hooked. It, you know, the, the gaming companies and the social networks, they've known these techniques for years and years and years. I wanted to democratize these methods so that everyone could, could utilize the same psychology that makes you know Facebook so sticky and YouTube so sticky and all of these products so habit forming so that we can build healthy habits right that's always been the goal of hooked and five years on that's exactly what's happened you know, there's been many many companies who have used hooked for good to build healthy habits however what I also noticed after I wrote hooked is that I was using these products and services some of these products and services more than I'd like 
and in mm. ways that I didn't always understand. I remember one particular occasion I was with my daughter. This was kind of a, a seminal moment in my life. I was with my daughter and I, I had this afternoon with her and we had this activity book of things that daddies and daughters could do together. And one of the activities was to ask each other this question. If you could have any superpower, what superpower would you want? And I wish I could tell you what my daughter said, but I can't because in that moment, I was on my device. I was distracted. Mm -hmm. I was looking at something on my phone when I, and I totally blew this perfect daddy-daughter moment. So that's when I realized, and this was very soon after publishing Hooked, I said, you know, wow, this is a problem, right? <laughs> if, if I'm struggling with this, then I'm guessing lots of people struggle with this. And so that's when I kind of started on this journey to understand why I was getting so distracted. And, you know, if you ask me today what superpower I would want, I would tell you I'd want the power to be indistractable because being indistractable is about doing what you say you are going to do. And I, I really call this the skill of the century. I mean, imagine if you did everything you said you would do. Now, the funny thing is, you know, in the, in the self-help or personal development industry, you know, we spend billions of dollars in this industry to get someone to tell us what to do. But if we're honest with ourselves, we already know what to do, right? You know how to lose weight, right? Stop, don't eat, you know, do, do, we all know that chocolate cake is less good for you than, than eating a healthy salad. We know that we have to go to the gym and exercise. If you want a, a good relationship, you have to be fully present with people. If you want to do really well at your job, well, you have to actually do the work. So mm -hmm. we know what to do. Why don't we do it? I thought this would be a pretty simple question, and I thought I would write basically like an unhooked. That's what my publisher wanted me to write. You know, here's how to stop using technology so much. But the more I got into this problem, this more I, I, I kept asking my, this, myself this question of why don't we do what we say we're going to do, I, I realized it was not an easily answered question. And then in fact, Socrates and Aristotle talked about this very same question 2,500 years ago. They called it akrasia, this tendency that we have to do things against our better interests. And so people have been struggling with distraction for a very, very, very long time. And so I realized that the problem was much bigger than our devices. The way I realized this, by the way, I did what all the books told me to do. I went and bought, like, you know, I'm looking at my bookcase right here next to me. And I, I bought literally every book on the topic of focus and, you know, technology distraction and digital detoxes. And I, I bought every book I could find. And they all basically said the same thing. They all said, stop using it, right? Go on a digital right. detox, uh, excise it from your life for 30 days, and then you'll figure it out. And, and I tried that. And you know what? It didn't work. And it didn't work for the same reason that, fad diets don't work. So I used to be clinically obese. Uh, I'm no longer clinically obese, thankfully, but I used to be. And I remember I would do all of these fad diets, right? No junk food for 30 days. And, and guess what happened on day 31? Blah, 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 right? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I would eat and make up for, for lost time because I hadn't dealt with the real root cause of the problem. And so that's what Indistractable is, is really about. What's the root cause of distraction? Why do we do things that we know are bad for us? Why do we go off track? And what do we do with it? How do we become indistractable? Now, is this specifically about the devices and those kinds of things? Or is this uh, about other things? Because your story about your daughter reminded me of a story with my wife. And this was before we had kids, thankfully. But it led to a really important conversation that we needed to have about boundaries and, and setting those boundaries and, and things like that. And this conversation was my wife and I were chatting on the couch and she was speaking. Sound was coming out. And – I was just nodding because in my head, I was thinking about my business and the next email I had to write or the next product I had to come out with or this other problem, whatever. And she caught me in the middle of that thought and she basically said, whoa, 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 hold on. You're thinking about your business right now, aren't you? And I was like, no. And she's like, okay, well, what's the last thing I said? And oh, I was like, oh, man. holy crap. And then I made the mistake of saying, well, the last thing you said was you're thinking about your business, aren't you? And and then it, that led to <laughs> all these other conversations. But it was really important to have because it made me realize I needed these boundaries, especially because we were going to have a kid and then we had another kid yeah. and I want to be fully present with them. So is this book about all kinds of distractions like the ones that are in our head taking us away from what we should be doing? Or is it about the – the distractions on our screens and the distractions in our pockets too. Yeah, so it, it's much bigger than the technology because because as you demonstrated, and by the way, listening to this story is so painful because it's happened to me too. <laughs> <laughs> so I totally feel your pain. I was cringing you're late. You're telling yes. me I knew exactly what you're going to say. And, and so the idea behind the book is that it's not – just about our devices. It's not about whatever latest gadget seems to distract us. Because as you demonstrated, 
distraction starts from within. And so we are always going to blame, and people love doing this, by the way, the latest, you know, it's very fashionable right now to say the technology is addicting us and it's hijacking our brain and it's melting our brains. And this has happened with every successive technological revolution. We always blame the latest technology. It happened with the radio, with the television, even TV, the written yeah. word, right? Everything was supposed to, you know, melt our brains. Even, you know, Socrates talked about how the written word was literally, you know, going to enfeeble people's minds. So, you know, this has been a very, very popular idea. But as you demonstrated, distraction starts from within. And if we don't deal with why we get distracted, then we'll never be able to overcome it. And so instead of blaming these proximal causes, right, the surface level analysis of whatever tool we're using to distract ourselves, the idea behind the book is what if we could always do what we say we're going to do? That's the goal behind becoming indistractable. It's not it's not that you never become distracted. It's that you strive to do what you say you're going to do. It's about personal integrity. And it's such an amazing superpower because, you know, as I mentioned before, we already know what to do. So the question is really, you know, why don't we do it? And mm -hmm. once we figure out this methodology, there's four basic parts to this methodology. Once we figure out the methodology, we can use it to change our life in terms of the what I call the personal domain. So this is about stuff we do for ourselves, our health, our mental well-being, you know, becoming more educated. We have more time to take care of our family, the family domain, so our relationships with other people in our lives, including friendships. You know, there's this crisis today that uh, of loneliness that we experience uh, in America where, you know, people do not have close friendships anymore. And part of this is because they're not doing what they say they're going to do. We know we should have friends but we're not making time for them. Why? Why don't we do what we say we're going to do? And then finally, the last domain is what I call the work domain. And this is about doing what you say you're going to do at work. I mean, I think if there's one rule to success, right? The one thing you need to do to be successful in life, it's do what you do at work, right? If you say you're going to meet a deadline, meet the deadline. If you say you're going to work on that big project, work on the big project. And yet so many of us, me included, right? Like I'd sit down at my desk and I'd say, okay, I've got that big project I need to work on. But let me just check email for a minute or, or that Slack channel seems important. And so I wasn't doing what I knew I should do, what I knew I wanted to do. I kept getting distracted. Yeah, I mean, my hand is up as well with uh, across all those domains. And it's something that I want to improve on. And I'm so thankful that there are people like yourself who are creating these methodologies for us to learn how to improve. Is this the same as just saying we need to be more disciplined or is it something different? No, so so here's the beauty of it. I am not a disciplined person. <laughs> In fact, I'm I'm pretty darn lazy. But the thing is, you know, the idea is that you can use certain methodologies to not require willpower, to not require self-discipline. And so the the phrase I want people to remember is that the antidote to impulsiveness is forethought. You see that the human brain has this amazing trait that no other animal in the animal kingdom has, which is the ability to predict the future with a high degree of, of accuracy, right? You know, the, the, maybe, either, you know, we know some animals like squirrels can hide their nuts for the winter, but they don't really understand. They, it's just an instinctual thing. They're not, they're not right. contemplating what winter will feel like when they do that. Human beings can plan ahead. We can see into the future. And so that is the antidote. And once you know these techniques, you have to know what to do. But once you know how to plan ahead, once you know how to use forethought, you actually don't need a lot of self-control. You don't need a lot of self-discipline. You don't need a lot of willpower because it happens automatically if you do the right things in advance. All right. So I think everybody's asking in their heads now, okay, what are these methodologies? And obviously it's in the book and that's where you can get all the details and stuff. But can you give us the rundown of sort of these things that we can start doing now so that we don't have to be so strong willed that we have to fight every single day to not open email or to use these apps like I, I can't even remember the name, but there's one that like forces you to not open certain things. You could set time limits on those. And I've tried those as well. And those don't work because I can just simply hack my way around it. Yeah. So, yeah. so what are these methodologies? All right. So what I'm going to give you is the strategy. Okay. Not the tactics. Tactics are what you do. The strategy is why you do it. And so yeah. there are lots of disparate tactics out there. You've heard a million of these tactics out there. Grayscale your phone or turn off notifications or, and, and many of these things may, you know, grayscaling your phone, I think is rubbish. That doesn't really work. But anyway, there's lots of techniques that I'm sure you've Wait, heard what is out that? there. 
it's let's, you know this idea of time. you know if you make your screen gray then you won't use it as much because it's more boring i don't know i i tried it and and the data doesn't look really good on it i didn't work certainly didn't work for me just like you know the digital detox idea of just stop using these technologies for 30 days and then you know you'll you'll be cured also didn't work for me it's so unrealistic right, right? i was like told this, to put like certain apps in the back like on the back page of my iphone where yeah. i have to swipe three times and guess what I would swipe three times to go get it anyway. <laughs> exactly. And so what, what you're describing are all these surface level tactics. And the reason that they tend not to work is because people haven't first tackled the real reason why we use these devices the way we do, or let me back up, not just devices, why we turn to any distraction, why we do anything against our better interest. The reason why has to do with why we're motivated to do anything. Right, so let's really let's go here to first principles. Why do we do anything we do? Most people believe in what Freud called the pleasure principle. The pleasure principle says that human behavior is motivated out of a pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain. Right? Seems pretty simple. Carrot and stick. Turns out it ain't true. That in fact we are not motivated by the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain. It's pain all the way down. Everything we do, all human behavior, neurologically speaking is about the desire to avoid discomfort. Everything you do, this is called the homeostatic response. Physiologically, think about it, right? So you go outside and it's cold. What do you do? You put on a coat, right? That feels better now. Then you go back inside, it's too hot. What do you do? You take the coat off. You do that to restore homeostatus, uh, to restore this homeostatic state, this, this balance of what your body wants, okay? Those are physiological sensations. Turns out the same exact rule holds true when it comes to psychological sensations. So where do we go when we're feeling lonely? Well, we check Facebook. Where do we go when we're feeling uncertain and we want to know the answer to something? We Google it. What about when we're feeling bored? Well, we check the news or stock prices or sports scores or Pinterest or you know, any number of other solutions because we don't like that sensation, that psychological itch that we seek to scratch. So if all human behavior, and even by the way, the desire for pleasure, right? You say, well, what about the pursuit of pleasure? Isn't That's not motivated by pain. In fact, it is. We know neurologically speaking that even craving for something, wanting something, right? Desire is uncomfortable. There's a reason why we say love hurts. It neurologically does because craving is uncomfortable. So if we agree that all human behavior is spurred by the desire to escape discomfort, what that means is, that time management is pain management. So if you mm. are driven off track, if you are distracted by something, every action that you take is driven by this desire to escape an uncomfortable sensation, which means the first step to becoming indistractable is to master your internal triggers, master these uncomfortable psychological states. And so in the book, I tell you how to do that. And there's only two solutions. You can either change the source of the discomfort. And so there's a whole chapter about creating an indistractable workplace because it turns out that where most people feel these internal triggers is from the workplace. So I uncovered some fascinating research about how certain types of workplaces leads to, literally causes, not just a correlation. There's a causal relationship between a certain type of work environment and depression and anxiety disorders. There's a certain type of work environment that literally makes us crazy. And these are work environments that have high expectations and low control. They create these internal triggers. And of course, the response to feeling these uncomfortable emotional states, stress, anxiety, uncertainty, fatigue, is to go to our devices, to look, call a meeting, to look for something online, to waste time by getting distracted, not doing what we seek to do because we are so desperate to scratch these uncomfortable psychological states. So hmm. a big part of the book is about how do you fix a type of work environment that creates distraction. I like to say that, you know, what, what I uncovered here is that distraction in the workplace is a symptom of cultural dysfunction, right? It's not that the technology is doing it to us at work. It's not Slack or email or your iPhone or whatever that's distracting you at work. It's this mm -hmm. dysfunctional culture that perpetuates this cycle of responsiveness that we always feel like we have to be checking. And it turns out that companies that tackle that problem don't have this problem around distraction. So there's a lot of ways we can either fix the source of the problem or you know, a lot of the discomfort of life, of being an adult, is not something that you can always fix, right? Life has uncomfortable moments to it. So the only other solution, if we're not gonna fix the source of the problem, is to learn how to cope with it. 
And so that's where I give these three methods to cope with the discomfort that drives us to distraction. And it starts by realizing that we are not built for satisfaction, that evolutionarily speaking, satisfaction did not help our species survive. Can you imagine you know, two groups of people on the Serengeti and one group of people is perpetually perturbed. They're always pissed off, just like we are. They always want more, more, more. And then you've got another tribe and they're cool. They don't need anything, right? They don't need more land. They don't need more animals. They don't need more anything. Well, which one is going to survive? You know exactly what's going to happen. And that's what our ancestors <laughs> did. We are, we are evolved from people who are constantly wanting more, 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 and more. And that's can get the best of us, clearly. That has some unhealthy consequences. It also makes us who we are, right? It's why we create life-saving medicine. It's why we overturn despots. It's why we go to explore outer space. It's all about this desire for more. Now, realizing that fact, to me, was very comforting because a lot of the self-help BS out there tells us that if you're not happy, you're not normal. And it turns out the exact opposite is true, that it's perfectly normal, that you are designed to be dissatisfied. But knowing that fact, you can harness it to your advantage. But to do that, you have to learn how to cope with these uncomfortable internal triggers. So that's the first step. Hmm. That's mouthful. (laughs) Yeah, it was. It makes me almost feel a little depressed, actually, that, you know, hey, being kind of unhappy is, is, are, are we saying that it's okay to be unhappy? I don't know if I would use the word unhappy as much as I would use unsatisfied. Unsatisfied. Okay, thank you. Right. So un- unhappy is, is a negative valence state, right? That's a problem. Now, unsatisfied is, is also, you know, it's not that you're, you're just not, you, you want more, right? And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Of course, it can get the best of us, but mm-hmm. if we know how to harness it, then we can use it to our advantage. We can use it to do amazing things in the world. Can you give me an example of a very common distraction that people have and how some of these innate sort of who we are can help us cope with those things? Sure. So let's see. So what, 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 you want to you want to do a case study about you? Is there an area of distraction that, or a type of distraction, or an area of your life that you feel you're distracted? Oh God. <laughs> uh, I love this. Thank you. Let's see. Let's talk about the workplace. You know, I'm building out yeah. this this studio, and I'm here doing this this podcast. And in between, when I'm supposed to be sort of answering emails and doing those things, and and it it is on my schedule to do that. I work really hard to try and honor my calendar. Yet I still get pinged here and there, and I get you know, Slack messages, which I know I can answer later, but I need, I I have a need to know what a person says right now, because what if that message is the one that they need my immediate answer for that could change everything. I have these weird thoughts in my head about, especially when it's my team. So that's why it's Slack, my team, they're pinging me. And yes, I have notifications on for certain ones, but even, even, even if they're direct messages, I know that nothing is going to change if I don't answer it immediately. Right. But what if it could Right, right, right. So this is this is a perfect example. In fact, there's a chapter in the book about how to manage group chat because I, I hear it so frequently about uh, you know how potentially distracting group chat can be. So let, you know what might be helpful. Let me talk about the the four steps real quick, just to get the picture in the listener's mind around what what it takes to become indistractable. And then what I want to do is to come back to this exact problem, and we'll work cool. through the indistractable model to to help give you some some real tactical steps that you can take. How's that sound? I like it. Thank you, Nir. All right. Terrific. So the first step is about mastering these internal triggers. We can either fix the source of the problem or learn to cope with the discomfort. And there's lots of techniques we can use to do that. The second big step is to make time for traction. So traction, the opposite of traction is distraction, right? Distraction and traction. Both traction and distraction have the same end word. They both end in the word action. They both actually come from the same Latin root, meaning to pull, trahare. Traction is things that pull you towards what you want in life, things that you do with intent, okay? Traction is great. The opposite of traction is distraction, any action that you take that is not what you intended to do, right? Something that takes you off track. Mm -hmm. Distractions are, are bad. So- The next step is to make time for traction. How do we make time for traction? To make time for traction, we have to turn our values into time. Many of us, including me, talk a good game. I used to, before I I started writing this book five years ago, I used to say that I have these values in my life, that you know, my family is number one, and that I'm very, you know, I'm taking care of my health is super important. Friends are very important in my life. But then when I would take a look at my calendar, there'd be nothing on that calendar that would tell you that those things are my values. 
So the fact is, two thirds of people out there do not keep a calendar. They keep no schedule whatsoever in their life. And so when I was writing this book over the past five years, I, I, I talked to hundreds of people and I, I worked with them to, to try these different techniques and see what works and what doesn't. And one of the most common things I would hear, people would complain to me about how distracting the world is and they can't get anything done and you know the, the, the pings and dings all around us and this happened in the news, they just can't concentrate. And I would say, wow, that's, that's really tough. You know, c- can I see what it is that you plan to do today? What did you get distracted from? And they'd take out their phone and they'd show me their calendar and they'd kind of sheepishly hand it to me and it would just be white. It'd be blank, <laughs> like maybe a dentist appointment or something on the calendar. So here's the thing. You cannot call something a distraction unless you know what it distracted you from. You can't call something a distraction unless you know what it distracted you from because it's impossible to say that something distracted you from something unless you knew what it was you were going to do with that time. Mm-hmm. So that's why it's essential that we have to use this time boxing technique. Now, I didn't make up time boxing. It's been around for a very, very long time. It uses a principle from psychology called setting an implementation intention, which is one of the most well-studied ways to make sure you do what you say you're going to do. It, it's just a fancy way of saying planning out what you're going to do and when you're going to do it. So I actually built a, a free tool. Uh, I'll give you a link to it in the show notes. It's on my blog where anybody can make what I call this calendar template. Now, that calendar template needs to fill up all of your waking moments need to be accounted for. That doesn't mean that you're going to be strictly, you know, if you fail for a minute, you're going to beat yourself up and you're a terrible human being. No, no, no. The idea here is that you have a template for how you wanted to spend your time so that if you do something that's not what you plan to do, you can identify the source of the problem. You can identify the distraction. Anything you plan to do is traction. Anything you didn't plan to do is distraction. So this is incredibly empowering, right? Just making that calendar to know the difference between traction and distraction is very, very important. And then the idea here, and what I teach you to do in the book, is to synchronize your calendar with the various stakeholders in your life, with your colleagues at work, with your spouse, your significant other, with yourself to review that calendar and make sure you have time to live out your values. And I show you how to do that in various domains of your life. Now, that's the second really, really important step. The third Mm -hmm. important step is to hack back external triggers. Now, earlier we talked about internal triggers, right? Those feelings inside of us that make us seek out traction or distraction. Then of course we have the external triggers, the pings, dings, rings, all of these things that prompt us to either do what we say we're gonna do or prompt us to distraction when we do something we didn't wanna do, right? So if my phone rings and it says, hey, it's time to go to the gym, that's what you plan to do, great. That external trigger led to traction. But if I get a notification while I'm with my daughter and I plan to be time, spend time with her and be fully present, well, now that external trigger led to distraction. So hacking back external triggers is really about asking yourself, is this trigger serving me or am I serving it? And then evaluating in all these various domains of our life where these external triggers exist. And I'm not just talking about our phones. It turns out the number one distraction that, that I found in my research that people experience throughout their day is distraction from other coworkers. So this was fascinating. I, did the, I, I found this amazing story of these nurses at UCSF who tackled what would be the third leading cause of death in the United States. So I'll give you a clue with what that is. So number one source of, of death is heart disease. Number two is cancer. The third leading cause of death. Can you guess what it is, Pat? The third leading cause of death in America? Ah, <sighs> You said heart disease, cancer. cancer. What's number three? Car accidents? You would think so, right? It's not. If it was a disease, it would be prescription mistakes. People wow. in hospitals getting the wrong medicine or the wrong dosage of medicine. And so these nurses wanted to tackle this problem. 200,000 people are affected every single year in the United States of America because of this very human mistake of giving people the wrong medication in hospital. Crazy, crazy. And it's 100% human error. So most hospitals are like, oh, it's nothing we can do, whatever, it's just a, a fact of life. Well, these nurses at UCSF decided to figure out what the source of the problem was. And they discovered that the solution to this problem, it wasn't some fancy, you know, multi-million dollar technology. It turned out that the solution to the problem was plastic vests, plastic vests that they wore that had written on these vests, medication rounds in progress. And what these vests did was alert their coworkers to the fact that they could not be bothered because at that moment, they were doing something that required their full focused attention. Why? Because we know when our attention is broken, our work suffers. 
So you can see the metaphor here, right? What, what these nurses discovered, by the way, these plastic vests reduce prescription mistakes by 88%. 88%, wow. they almost eliminated the problem completely. So the metaphor here for us, you know, people who work as knowledge workers, our work product is also hurt when we are distracted. And so in the book, in the hardcover copy of the book, or if you order it uh, in a Kindle, I, I, I give you a, an address to get it, an email address to get it. You can tear out this, this piece of cardstock, fold it up, and it's this red sign you put on your screen that says, I am indistractable, please come back later, right? And that's nice. one example. There's about you know, 45 other examples of ways to hack back these external triggers to make sure that the external triggers serve us as opposed to us serving them. I like that. Before we get to the fourth one, it makes me think yep. of this movement not too long ago about open air offices and how that was supposed to lead to a lot more collaboration, random chances of meeting in the hallways or next to each other to be able to collaborate and grow your business. But then I recently saw that there were other studies done more recently that says that it's probably the worst thing you can do as a business is to have these open air sort of uh, open air offices or open space offices. Um, yeah. I would imagine that that's because you're, you're getting a lot of these distractions all day with no control whatsoever. That's right. That's right. So, so the idea is how do we keep the good aspects? We know that the open floor plan offices actually do have some good aspects. These good aspects happen when people kind of bump into each other going from place to place, right? You're, you're, right, go, right. you're, you're going from here to there to one meeting to the next. It's, oh, hey, how's it going, Bill? What, what's the status of such and such project? And you, you chat for a minute or you go to the water cooler or the break room, whatever, and you see each other and you get, you know, that's where a lot of ideas are, are hatched when people have these, you know, desperate work products and then they can discuss, you know, these, these various ideas. The problem is what we didn't anticipate is that it becomes so easy to interrupt people when they're trying to think. It's a disaster because we know the only way that human beings can solve complicated problems. And look, the fact is the only jobs that are going to be left, the jobs that are not going to be automated away are the ones that the machines can't do. The machines can't do the kind of tasks that require human ingenuity and creativity. And the only way that we can be creative is if we focus, if we reflect. And so part of this movement I want to create is to stop all of this reacting. All we do all day long is react, 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 constantly responding to every ping and ding. Instead, we need to carve out time in our day to reflect because that's where we do our best work. Love that. Cool. And then you said there was a fourth method. Right. So the four steps, remember how we talked about the, you know, that we got traction and then we got distraction. Well, the fourth step is to prevent distraction with pacts. So this is only something we do after we've done the other three steps, after we've mastered internal triggers, after we've made time for traction, after we've hacked back external triggers. We want to do this last. And to prevent distraction with packs, this is a very old technique that it was first described 2,500 years ago in the story of the Odyssey by Homer. 2,500 years ago this was written. So the story of Ulysses, you may be familiar with it. He has to sail his ship past the island of the Sirens. The Sirens sing this mythical song, this magical song that anybody who hears crashes their ship on the shores of the Sirens Island and dies. Well, Ulysses knows this, and so he plans ahead, right? The, the, the antidote to impulsiveness is forethought. So he thinks ahead, he plans ahead, and he decides to ask his crew to bind him to the mast of his ship, and he instructs everyone in his crew to put beeswax in their ears so they can't hear the siren song. So he's driven temporarily insane. He, he yells and cries. He says, let me go, let me go. But his crew can't hear them so that he can successfully navigate past this distraction, past this thing that he knows he's going to get tempted to do. And he plans ahead and he doesn't get distracted. He safely sails his, his ship home. So we can use the same idea of a pre-commitment, as it's called, to help us make sure we don't get distracted. And there are three types of, of pacts. We can use effort pacts, price pacts, and identity pacts. Now, effort packs are whenever we make something that we don't want to do more difficult, right? So, for example, in my household, every night, the internet shuts off at 10 p.m. I used to actually use this uh, outlet timer that I got at Home Depot for like five bucks that I connected mm -hmm. to my monitors and my, and my uh, router. Now my router actually is built in with this function in it. It turns off the internet at 10 p.m. because that's when I know I want to go be with my wife and go to bed and, you know, call it a night. That's an example of an effort pact. I could do something about it, right? I could unplug or rewire or something, but it requires more effort. And that bit of effort helps me do what I want to do. Then you've got a price pact. A price pact is when there's some kind of cost to doing the thing you don't want to do. So one technique I talk about in the book that's gotten me in the best shape of my life is called the burn or burn technique. Have you heard about this before? I have not. 
All right. So the burner burn technique, here's how it works. Every day I go into my closet when I get dressed in the morning and I have my calendar. And on this calendar is taped a fresh, clean, crisp $100 bill on today's date. Above the calendar is a Bic lighter. Now, every day I have a choice to make. I can either go burn some calories in the gym and do some physical activity, or I have to burn the $100 bill. Now, it's been three years, and I've never burned the $100 bill. Because when it comes to, okay, am I going to do what I say I'm going to do, right? If this is a value that I have to take care of my physical health, I have to make this choice. Either do some push-ups, take a walk, go to the gym, do what it is I say I'm going to do, or burn that $100 bill. Now, of course, people say, oh, I'm not, you can't burn the $100 bill. I can't afford that. That's exactly the point. You don't want to burn the $100 bill. You want to do the thing that you said you're going to do. So there are many, many other examples of price packs, but that's kind of a, a simple one that I use every single day. And then finally, perhaps the most powerful pact is an identity pact. Because what we know is that identity change is behavior change, and behavior change is identity change. So what I did and when I researched this book is that I looked to religion and I learned from organized religion and how amazing it is that so many religions can get people to do things with very little effort, right? Without willpower, without a lot of self-discipline that people who are not parts of that religion would find very difficult, right? So if you think about you know, a devout Muslim, uh, they're not debating whether they should have a uh, tequila or a beer every day. No, it's just something they don't do. They don't drink. Whereas for many people, giving up alcohol would be difficult. Uh, or a devout Jew, right? You know, if you say they don't, they're not debating whether they should have pork every day, it's just something they don't do. Uh, I used to be a vegetarian for a very, very long time. It wasn't hard to give up meat because I was a vegetarian. So if you can make an identity for yourself, if you can create a pact, and even more importantly, preach that identity to others, much like religions do. You know, we think that religions proselytize because they want to get converts. Actually, the reason it's so effective is because it solidifies the belief of the person doing the preaching. So Mm -hmm. if you can have a new identity, and this is exactly why I call the book Indistractable, because I want people to have this moniker of, oh, I'm indistractable. This is why I do these slightly strange things that most people don't do. It's because I am indistractable. That's who I am. So that's how we make an identity pact. So these are just, you know, just touching the surface of a few techniques here. But the idea here is to use these four techniques in concert to understand the strategy behind the tactics of how to make sure we do what we say we're going to do. Now, when you set these packs, for example, you gave the one about burning the $100 bill. What's to stop you from not exercising and not burning that $100 bill? Are there... Because I can imagine that happening yeah, very easily. Yeah. You know, you say that you're going to do that, but then you don't exercise and then you don't burn the bill. So you're like, ah, oh, it's okay. Right. So this is this is where this is why that that technique comes last. And so many people have heard of different techniques where you you know put some money on the line, and right. if you don't do what you say you're going to do, you're going to lose the money. The problem with this technique, and this is the only technique that I described that actually can backfire. And the reason it can backfire is that if you don't know how to cope with failure then it backfires because you beat yourself up. And so that technique is for only, only for people who know how to use self-compassion. It turns out self-compassion is a really important trait that people who are more self-compassionate are much more likely to reach their long-term goals. So I teach you in the book how to be self-compassionate. So the idea is that you are able to cope with these potential failures in your life, which all of us have, right? We all will have uh, occasions when we give in to distraction. Again, being indistractable is not about never getting distracted. It's about striving to do what you say you're going to do. But as long as you have that, that toolkit of, of knowing how to be self-compassionate, you can get back on, on the wagon and, and continue with, with that path. And you can use these techniques effectively. So it's really about having the, the ability to be self-compassionate you know, the ability to move beyond failure. Love it. Thank you. We'll yeah, go yeah, back I think to the, ask example, the same yeah. thing. I wanted to get back to your Slack problem. Okay, so where do we go from there? So yeah. I have said to myself that I know I shouldn't be distracted, that these messages that are coming in, probably not so important and life-changing that I have to answer them right at this moment. Yet, even though I'm in the middle of a task, I still check them. Right. So here's what I would do. Start with the internal triggers, right? The first thing is always to master the internal triggers, to figure out what is the thing you are escaping? What's that uncomfortable sensation? And again, this isn't about judgment, right? This isn't for someone to judge you or for you to judge other people. It's about sitting with yourself and asking, what is that feeling I'm looking to escape from? 
And for some people, it's the corporate environment, right? It's stress from their boss. You know, I can tell you all these techniques to make you indistractable, but if your boss insists on calling you at 9 p.m. when you're, you know, getting ready for bed or whatever, it's very hard to say, no, I refuse. So some of this does come as a factor of the corporate workplace, and there's a whole section in the book on how how to deal with that. But let's say if it's, you know, you're your own boss, you can make your own decisions here, you know, then I would advise you to get curious about that sensation. So one of the the techniques I describe in the book is about reimagining the internal triggers, understanding on a deeper level what's going on. And so coping with it from these techniques that I, I borrowed from acceptance and commitment therapy. So I'll just give you one technique that I use all the time, which is called the 10 minute rule. The 10 minute rule says that you could give in to any temptation, whether it's a piece of chocolate cake, whether it's not going to the gym, whether it's whatever it is that you know you shouldn't do and you feel tempted to do, you can give in to that temptation in only 10 minutes, like literally just 10 minutes. And it turns out that that 10 minutes helps us ride out these negative emotions, these negative sensations, it's called surfing the urge and lets them pass. Because we used to think there's this myth, you, you probably heard of ego depletion, this idea that willpower is like a limited resource. It's like a gas tank that runs out. It yes. turns out that's, that's actually not true. There's been many studies that can't replicate those results. It turns out the only people who experience ego depletion are people who believe it is true. <laughs> right, interesting. And it's fascinating. So what that means is when we tell ourselves, oh, we're spent, I deserve this, I've been working hard, we actually make it true. Whereas willpower is not like a gas tank. It turns out what what Michael Inslich proposed is that willpower is just an emotion. So just as we wouldn't say, oh, I ran out of happy or I ran out of sad, it doesn't work that way. No, emotions crest and then leave, right? They dissipate. And so using techniques like the 10-minute rule, and there's many, many others that I describe in the book that we can use, these are some of the techniques that we can cope with that discomfort. So that's part of it is to have in your tool belt these tools that you can use to cope with discomfort when you feel it. So that's how you can start to master the internal trigger. That's really uh-huh. cool. When I think when I think about the Slack issue and, and, and you made me think internally about, okay, well, what's the reason why I'm checking this? What's the fear? What's going through my head at that time? And I had alluded to this earlier. It's the fear that maybe you know, I might be upsetting somebody if I don't answer them right away, right. Right? right? Which then might lead me to believe, okay, well, would I actually upset somebody if I didn't answer them immediately? And I know the truth to that is, is, is no. And I do have time in my calendar to go in that my team knows that I do go into Slack and answer questions that I'm not going to disappear. And I think I just have to realize that and, and cope with that internal urge and, and realize and almost kind of swat it away. Like, no, that's yeah. not true. Yeah, yeah. Is, well, is that the way to kind of tackle do, that? You're right on, Pat. I mean, that is exactly right. What most people do is they either blame or shame, right? The blamers say, mm-hmm. oh, stupid Slack. It's always doing this to me. <laughs> and they blame the technology. The shamers say, oh, there's something wrong with me. Stop feeling this way. This is a bad feeling. And it turns out neither of those are true. That what we want to do is we don't want to just you know say, stop feeling that, Pat. What we want to do is to get curious about it. Because it turns out when we become more curious about a negative sensation, it goes away. By the way, the opposite is true about a positive sensation. The more focus we become on a positive sensation, the more it expands. <laughs> but with a negative sensation, the more we focus on it and we begin to rationalize, we begin to think to ourselves, actually, you know what? If somebody really needed me urgently, would they send me a Slack notification? If the office was on fire, they would call me. They would text message. They wouldn't send a Slack notification. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's about giving yourself that bit of room to surf the urge to get comfortable with that internal trigger until it dissipates and goes away. I love that. Thank you. That's super helpful. I think that's going to help a lot of people. I can't wait to dive into this book and I can't wait for my audience to start diving in as well. I also know that you have some, so first of all, you mentioned the calendar template Yeah. uh, and then also there's a chance to still get it on pre-order and get, get something else along with that. Can you, can you share with us exactly what those things are? Yeah, absolutely. So the book is available September 10th in the United States, and it's available wherever books are sold. But if you order it before that date, if you pre-order it, you can actually get a PDF of the entire book, which means you kind of get a two for one. So if you order the audio book or if you order the hardcover book uh, or you order the Kindle book and you want a PDF of the book, you can actually get it right away at indistractable.com. You just pre-order it somewhere else. You go to indistractable.com. You enter in the order number from wherever you ordered it from, and then we will email you right away a PDF as Long, uh, along with a bunch of other resources and tools and templates that you can use to help you become indistractable. By the way, just wanted to mention, just fixing the internal trigger that we talked about with your Slack habit, 
is just the first step. <laughs> the the second step, I know we're running out of time here, but the second step is to Let's make time for, for that behavior, right? To put time on your calendar, which sounds like you already do, which is terrific. Most mm -hmm. people don't do that. They just let Slack interrupt them or email interrupting interrupt them all day long. So I give a lot of techniques around how to manage email, how to manage Slack, some people have reported that they reduce their time spent on email by 90% by using some of these techniques. Uh, wow. Then you want to make sure that we hack back the external triggers. So making sure that, hey, you know what? If Slack doesn't serve you when it interrupts you in the middle of your day, then we have to hack back those external triggers. Remove the pings and dings that so right. often lead to distraction, right? That's a simple step you could do in this case with, with Slack. And then finally, you could use pre-commitments. You could use a pact. So you can use these apps for select times in your day. I wouldn't recommend doing it all day long. But if you say, you know what, right now I need to work on this project and I need a good 45 solid minutes of focus, well, then you can use apps like Freedom or Focus or Rescue Time. or I mean, there's just dozens of these that I talk about to help tune out distraction, to enter into a little pact. So for example, Every day when I write, you know, writing's really hard. I constantly yeah, am tempted to, to get distracted, to Google something or email something. Mm -hmm. I use this app called Forest that is free. I open the app. I dial in how much time I want to do focused work for. And if I pick up my phone and do anything with it, this little virtual tree dies. Right? It's a stupid little virtual tree. Who cares? No way. <laughs> but it's enough of a commitment. It's enough of a, a reminder to remind me, hey, you know what, Nir? You, you plan to do something else. This is not what you plan to do. Picking up that phone right now is a distraction. So again, it's not something we want to do all day long, and it's something we want to do last as the last step of becoming indistractable, but it can be a very effective technique. That's really interesting. But before you go, and we'll get that URL one more time for everybody in a sec, but another thing that I know takes people away from what I know they should be doing is just the consumption of all the great content that's out there, mm. including my podcast. Yeah. Some people email me and they go, Pat, I've listened to every single episode over the last four months. Every day I listen to four or five episodes. I'm like, are you crazy? Like go and take action on these things that I'm teaching you. <laughs> Don't listen to every single episode. But we kind of often default to let's learn as much as we can before we go. And I'm curious to know your thoughts, especially as somebody who is productive, who is writing amazing books, and who is an expert on distraction and indistraction. How can we balance consumption versus action when it comes to wanting to create and wanting to build? Yeah, this is a terrific question. So there's a quote by Kierkegaard who said, anxiety is the dizziness of freedom. Anxiety is the dizziness of freedom. And, and it, this is, you know, this was true when he wrote it. It's even more true today because we live in a world with so much choice, with so many interesting, good things to explore. Mm -hmm. That it, you know, we we would have to live several lifetimes to ever <laughs> absorb what's created every day out there on the internet. There's so many good things to to learn from. The problem is, if we do that, then exactly what you said, you know, we 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 just consume and we have no time to create. And then we look back with regret on our lives because we didn't do what we wanted to do with our lives. So the idea here is, is not to necessarily have a moral judgment. A lot of people will say, oh, you know, uh, video games bad, reading books good. Well, I don't take that point of view. That's a very moralistic argument because look, you know, my daughter got into Harry Potter, you know, last year and she one day she spent 5 hours reading Harry Potter. Well, you know what? 5 hours of Harry Potter is too much. You know, reading is not always good. If you consume too much, it comes at a price and that price it's not that it's melting your brain, right? I don't th believe this, this garbage that these products, you know, the tech products, Facebook and Instagram are melting our brains or addicting us. I think that's rubbish. What they are doing is they are costing us our time, our attention. And that price that we are paying is paid in the opportunity cost, the things you could have done with your time. That's the real price. So we don't need to get into a moral panic that these things are bad. They're not bad if we use them with intent. So for example, to answer your question around content, there's nothing wrong with consuming content. I mean, I've learned so much from your podcasts and audiobooks and content out there. It's wonderful. The idea is to make time for your values. So if self-education is one of your values, it's terrific. Make time for it on your calendar. So for me, there is time in my calendar. So I love listening to podcasts in the gym. So I use this technique called temptation bundling, where I listen to podcast episodes and audiobooks when I'm in the gym. That's kind of my reward for going on a walk or going to the gym. And it's on my calendar. And you know what? There's nothing wrong with it. It's beautiful. It's only when we do these things when we didn't intend to, when we use these products as an escape 
from our uncomfortable realities. And therefore, we do what the app maker wants or what the content creator wants as opposed to what we really want. Right. Dude, great answer. Love it. Thank, thank you, Nir, for that. I cannot wait to get your book. I recommend everybody grab it before it comes out next week because we'll have that pre-order bonus. Where can people go to submit their receipt and, and order number to get that? Absolutely. So it's indistractable.com is the URL. It's uh, I-N-D-I-S-T-R-A-C-T-A-L. Uh, wait, I think I misspelled that. You may have to. <laughs> Did I misspell that? I, I don't know. A-E-L-A. <laughs> Sorry, I think I messed up. I hope you're. Yeah, I it's hope okay. you can edit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And even if not, this is real life. I I n d i s t r a c t a b l e. Thank you, Amazon. And um, dude, you rock, man. Keep pumping out the great content. And thank you for your time and effort, not just here on the show, but just to help people with these really, really important things that are literally life changing. So thank you so much for what you do, Nir. And it was great to have you back on. My pleasure. This was really fun. Thank you, Pat. All right, I hope you enjoyed that episode with Nir Al, the author of the brand new book, Indistractable. And hopefully this episode has made you more indistractable, have had less distractions. And yes, there are tactics, strategies, things you can do, apps, programs that can help you. But really it starts right up there in your head and, and knowing why and understanding it and coping and all the, like, all the things we talked about today, so good, the science behind it. And you can under, once you understand it, you could deal with it, right? That's what I always say about everything. Once you can understand it, you can deal with it. And we have a better understanding of distraction. I'm just so thankful that Nir stepped up to write this book over the past five years. And uh, it has really, really become something that I've really believed in everything he's talking about. So make sure you grab the book if you haven't already. You can check out the links in the show notes over at smartpassiveincome.com slash session 387. Smartpassiveincome.com slash session 387. Uh, and of course, just look up Indistractable on Amazon or if you want to go directly there, smartpassiveincome.com slash indistractable. And that is an affiliate link, just so you know. And thank you once again for supporting SPI, supporting the great guests that we have here on the show. And most of all, supporting your life and your family and your work and your commitments and honoring those things that you put in your calendar. That's what it's all about. I'm here to help and serve you. And let me know what you thought about this episode. Give me a shout out on Twitter or Instagram if you've loved this and also reach out to Nir as well, N-I-R-E-Y-A-L. And uh, let us know what you thought. Thank you so much. Team Flynn, you're amazing. Cheers, Team Flynn for the win. Thanks for listening to the Smart Passive Income Podcast at www.smartpassiveincome.com. Starting a business can feel daunting and confusing, but it doesn't have to be. That's why Terry Rice started the Launch Your Business podcast, another awesome show from the Entrepreneur Podcast Network. Each week, Terry shares strategic actions, specific tools, and what he refers to as high-performance mindsets that allow you to thrive under pressure. Recent guests include rapper T.I., Amy Porterfield, and yours truly. And Terry frequently publishes value-packed solo shows too, like this one titled How to Write Proposals That Get Accepted and Don't Take Forever to Write. Great stuff. So make sure you listen in to launch your business right now on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, or Stitcher.